been erected, he found Mr. Ayers a homeless man, playing not as a panhandler, but for himself. Music to chase away the demons that forever stalk him. What piqued your curiosity in the first place about this homeless guy? Uh, desperation, <laughs> sweating out another column. Looked like it could work. I thought, okay, where did this all begin? How's this guy end up on this uh, street corner? Shalomo. Mr. Lopez would find that Mr. Ayers, now 58, was once a hugely gifted young musician accepted by Juilliard, the country's preeminent music school, whose talent and future were crushed by the weight of a devastating incurable mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia. His passion for music is perfectly clear. His illness becomes obvious as he tries to describe Beethoven. And there he is still there. The consternation, and he's complete with another symphony, the elucidation, you know, and my mind goes, wow, you know, and the bird droppings are wiped away by the workers, and he's just as real and green as the next tree, or a uh, uh, beautiful uh, a scene. But, you know, a conversation with Mr. Ayers can switch with lightning speed from one fixation to another, Stravinsky, baseball. Barbara Eden, Colonel Sanders. Tangled thoughts followed by moments of perfect clarity. Music is saying, you know, life isn't that bad, you know. Mr. Lopez began writing columns about Mr. Ayers, his illness, his life on the streets. And before the darkness descended as a supremely talented kid growing up in Cleveland. Did you look up to him at that point in your life, your big brother? Always have. I still do. Jennifer Ayers Moore is Nathaniel's sister. She remembers the family's pride in his acceptance to Juilliard in 1970 when he was 19, and the alarm they felt when he came home one summer. He was always neat, always well-groomed, and when we went to pick him up from Juilliard, I was really shocked that he had on an old tattered like sweater, and he just didn't look like the brother that I saw leaving to go to New York. He was one of only a few black students in his class at Juilliard where the competition was cutthroat. It was really sink or swim. He had to prove himself as a musician and probably on some level had to um, uh, disabuse people of the notion that maybe he was there because he was African American. His grades were dropping. He was angry and confrontational with teachers and fellow students. Nobody knew what was going on with Nathaniel, but in fact he was losing his mind. He ended up in a police car on his way to Bellevue Hospital, and that was it. His, uh, his career went off a cliff. Um, this career that um, you know, might well have landed him in one of the great orchestras of the world was done. He went back to Cleveland to the home he grew up in, but eventually drifted away to live on the streets. Medication didn't help. Out of options, his mother agreed to a last resort, shock therapy. She felt like this was going to be it. And I remember when he came out, he had this, this look on his face. Um, it was almost like a zombie. Uh, she expected him to go in and come out a different person. And that it just didn't work out that way. Isn't the point. The fact that he has people that understand him and that respect him and that uh, wish him well. I think that is in, in, incredibly therapeutic for him. And to no longer be considered some nut on the street. Exactly. But with terrifying memories of shock treatment and the medication he was given years ago, Mr. Ayers refuses to try new, more effective drugs now used to reduce the ravages of schizophrenia. So his demons still take charge. You want to believe that this man is well on the way to recovery. Um, the next day, he's the devil. His eyes um, are bloodshot, and there's rage and terror in them. Kiss my mother ass. We got a small taste of that at Lamp, where Mr. Ayers sleeps. I ain't here to be bothered by nobody like that, okay? They 
out here so I can't have a key to the piano room, so that yeah. His sister had come from Atlanta to visit him for the first time in months. He'd had an argument with someone about getting the key to her room where he practices. He was enraged. Does he know, does he understand, do you think, just how sick he is? You know, sometimes I want to say, no, he doesn't. But then other times, my heart is saying that someday he's going to just say, you know, I don't want to live like this anymore. Um, I need to do something. But that's just a hope.